I just did really well at the RX competitions without like much training. And I was at that point, I was only taking classes. And so I'm like, well, if I started like doing just a little bit extra after classes, like working on my weaknesses, like then I'd be even better. And then I would do started just like adding little things. And then just it led to like, I got one of the gyms that I went to, they had um, like regular programming and then they had like um, above and beyond. So then I switched to that. And so I did that for a while. And I don't know, just I just kept adding little bits. I didn't just go from like a class to, oh, let me get individualized programming and spend four hours at the gym every day. I slowly eased into just adding a little bit here and there. And that just led me to where it is now. There's gonna be a whole lot of things that are outside of your control. Let them go. Let them go. Just focus on what is the best thing I can do. The best thing I can do to maximize my potential. My potential. My potential. Five, four, three, two, one, go. Hi Ben. So today we've got our first special guest. Um, Brooke Wells was in town a few weeks ago. She sat down with me, um, and we were able to chat a little bit. But I wanted to talk before we get into that about. Um, well, about Brooke. So Brooke is your most recent athlete. Um, mm -hmm. She came on board when uh, Michelle Laton retired. Yep. So I think the first question I've got is just, maybe if you can give us a little bit of context on how you choose or who you choose or how many athletes you choose to work with um, every year, because I know it's not random. It's not a whoever asks gets to do it. Um, you sort of got, over the years, you've sort of figured out something that works for you. Yep. Um, so it's definitely over the years figuring out what works for me. It wasn't something I just came up with. Um, I started my coaching career by coaching my wife, my team, and then lucky enough to coach Chris Spieler. Um, when I started working with Chris, all of a sudden that was like the beginning of like the coaching thing in CrossFit and people started reaching out a little bit more. Um, the success I've had with uh, individuals, most notably, obviously Matt and Katrin last year, a fair amount of athletes have reached out to me. The way I choose my athletes is... I found what works for me in terms of a team, and we actually we call it that, where mm -hmm. we call ourselves a team, is two guys and two girls. It's it, it's small enough that I'm able to give attention to everybody, and I give different levels of attention to everybody. Some people get daily programming. Some people it's everything, like what, what they're eating, and other people it's you know every other day check-ins um, with a little more macro approach. But it allows me to give the attention that they need and they want and what works best for them. It also is big enough. I have two, two and two that there's this shared camaraderie. Mm -hmm. There's a buddy there's, you know, in, in some systems they call it like an accountability buddy. Yep. Like, did you do this workout? They can bounce things off each other. Um, what was your time? How did you do this? how did you strategize this one? Um, it, get, it creates more of a team atmosphere than if I was just to have one guy or one girl. Yep. Um, or 12 or 15. Yeah, so it's small <clears throat> enough, but it's big enough. And what's funny is even the guys measure themselves against the girls and back and forth. So Matt recently has been texting Katrin almost daily about, you know, how she how he's doing. And he's pretty excited when he's beating <laughs> her. Um, but I really like the two and two. It's worked really well for us. Good. Um, so let's talk about Brooke a little bit. She, like I said, was is the most recent uh, addition to the team. So how does that how does that work? How does that look? Is it um, when you knew Michelle was going to retire and that you had sort of space to fill? <clears throat> was that something you, you sat down and said, hmm, I wonder who I would like to work with? Was it Brooke reached out to you? Was it some combination of, you know, did Catherine say, hey, you should we should bring Brooke on? What did that look like? Yeah, it was uh, it was actually a combination of the two. So the entire year when I knew Michelle was not going to be competing this year and she was going to retire, I knew we had a girl spot to fill. So I talked it over with. Katrin, um, talked about with some with Cole, talked about a fair amount with Matt O'Keefe, who's um, both of their agents and a good buddy of mine and is Brooke's agent as well. And um, kind of like th vetted the the game's girls to see who we thought would be the right fit for us. Um, and Brooke fit the build. She not necessarily the physical build, but um, the the what we look for in athletes. So tell me a little bit about what you saw in Brooke that made her the right athlete. So the obvious n number one is potential, right? We want like really um, top level athletes. That's who I want to be working with. It's obviously who's motivating and I'm lucky enough to be able to work with those guys. So that's the first one is like somebody that is 
um, has potential to be at the top of the game. That's kind of easy enough. There's a lot of athletes right. that fit that build, right? Right. The really important ones are, I call it CCPP. So, so is, are they, first one is coachable. Mm -hmm. And coachable is not what people think it is. I don't think. I believe most people think themselves coachable if when someone's giving them advice, they look the person in the eye, they mull it over in their heads, and they give it good contemplation. And that to me is like, I'm a coachable athlete. Like, right. I heard what you said. That sounds like a good idea. I'm going to store that in the back of my head for later use. Yep. And people will say like, yeah, that means I'm coachable. That's like a, a, a D minus in my book. That's a <laughs> passing grade. Yeah. For me, what coachable looks like is if I give you a idea, I want you to run with it to the point where you are going to bust your ass to see if it might produce some results. Mm -hmm. An example I'll give on that is maybe we have an athlete who's pretty good at climbing ropes. Let's Matt Fraser. He's, you know, as much as people think is he struggles with them. He is phenomenal at climbing ropes. Well, if I give him a different way of climbing a rope, that he's not only just gonna be like, well, no, no, I'm good. Like I can yeah. climb, I can do 10 rope climbs in under two and a half minutes. Mm -hmm. And he can. If that's if he's like, no, no, I'm good, that's I'm good enough at that. That's not a coachable athlete. What I want is he'll sit on it, observe it, work with it, and spend 40 hours trying the new technique to see if it might shave off three seconds. Mm -hmm. That's coachable. It's a crazy level of work ethic for something that may or may not pay off, yep. but the belief system is there and I'm gonna try everything I have to have yep. that. So coachable is one. The next one's confident. And I don't think people misconstrue what confidence is. Confidence is not, I'm gonna win. Mm -hmm. I have the ability to win. What confidence is, I know if I do what is in my, if I do what coach says, I'll be okay. Mm -hmm. That's what confidence is. The third is that they're passionate, is my job is not to motivate athletes. If I'm, if I'm trying to push you to get you back in the gym for session number three of the day, you're not the right athlete for me. That's not who I wanna be working with. I want the opposite. I want somebody that we've done three sessions and they're like, can I do one more thing? And I have to say, no. Yeah. I want the sled dogs, yeah, I want the workhorses. I want the people I love to do this, they're passionate about it. They'd rather be in the gym. Their worst day is a rest day. That's what I want. And uh, the last piece is that they're positive. Never complain, never whine, and never make excuses. Simple and hard. <laughs> Usually the best things are. Right. So, okay, so specifically, Brooke, wh what have you seen or where have you focused um, with her training? And it's been, I don't know, six months? Uh, we started in that? we started in late August, Okay, so right after the games. So where did you start? And then where what have you seen in terms of progression on her end? And then where do you think sort of this season is going to go for her? So first time I met Brooke was at a, um, a Noble. She's a Noble athlete, and I'm uh, part of Noble. Um, I was at a Noble training camp in New York City. And it's the first time I ever worked with her really on a one-on-one -on -one setting. Um, and that's really was a really eye-opening experience for me for how coachable she was. They were there with a bunch of different athletes, but she was the sponge. She was the one that, as I gave her critical feedback, was so eager about the critical feedback. There was never a, well, yeah, but this is the way I do it. It was all just the opposite. It was an amazing experience. So after that, we invited her up to train with us leading into, um, I think it was even leading up to the regionals or very shortly after regionals before the games really got into full swing. Yep. And she worked with Katrin. And again, I really saw her ability to absorb and uh, want to be a student of the game. At that time, I saw all the things I could do to help her. And actually, we joke about it now, but I told her, I was like, I had this conversation with her. I was like, you know, after a session that she did with Katrin, and it was a lifting session, it was some sort of like heavy barbell cycling. So I wasn't, but imagine it was like um, heavy Is Isabel, mm -hmm. something like that. And she obviously did very well. And I remember having the conversation with her. I wasn't her coach at the time, but I was like, um, you're a really good athlete, but you move terribly. <laughs> You have so much room to improve. Um, One thing we may, talked about was how- Maybe we'll talk about that in August. Yeah. <laughs> One of the things that she and I talked about was how most of her training, CrossFit training has been alone, yeah. you know, in a gym with and with or without a coach, but certainly not without with somebody sort of at your caliber looking at her. So then we brought her in on August, in, in August, um, and we started working with her um, 
And from then till now, she's been with me probably three or four different times for short periods. She's still a student. She's yep. still in college. Um, and uh, I do her daily programming um, otherwise. But major things we're focusing on is um, what we started off really early on with was um, being a smarter athlete. She was young. Um, she was um, new to the sport, and she competed the way most athletes compete in our sport. Yep. Um, which isn't with uh, competitive excellence, mm -hmm. which is what I call it. So we worked a lot on just bringing in some efficiencies, not only in her movements but her approach to workouts. That was our number one focus. The thing we're more focusing on now is trying to create some more efficiencies in her movement. Um, and she has some major holes in terms of some movement patterns in a lot of. <clears throat> in a lot of fundamental movements, lifts, mechanics type stuff. So um, those are the two major areas. She already has a very good head. She's super confident, super passionate, um, super positive. So I don't need to do a ton of that. Um, we're trying to work on more efficiencies, um, more like actually like the scientific type of things. Right. Uh, the last piece we're doing is we're uh, working a lot on nutrition. Mm -hmm. So she started working with our Team nutritionist, which is a D um, from Working Against Gravity, um, did a lot to help uh, clean up um, Katrin and Cole leading up to the games last year. Yep. And Brooke has already um, leaned out tremendously in the last, it's only been a short time, yeah. probably six weeks. Yeah. One thing that I that she and I talked about was the um, when you look at the, the, the athletes who have been really successful on the female side um, at the games, there's been a good amount of variance in people from everybody from Chris Clever to Sam Briggs to Katrin, certainly the type of athlete they are is really varied compared to, I mean, the, the men's side is a little bit narrower cause it's like rich or Matt, yep. but, but I'm, I'm curious to hear from you, Brooke being at least considered a strong athlete, right? A barbell, you know, uh, yep. favored athlete. Do you, do you think, one, do you think that that categorization is accurate? And if it is, does that hurt her at all? Or what are you guys trying to do to sort of bridge the gap between the, the quote unquote strong athlete and yep. the the all around athlete so as as Catherine is that in order for her to sort of step up the game? Yeah, I think that the categorization of um, the women's side and the men's side is accurate for sure. The overall athletes on the men's side have dominated because it's been rich. Yeah. Um, but even for Rich, Graham was on right. one, and he's for sure in uh, a jack of all trades. Yep. Um, and then Miko before that, for sure. Absolutely. And then Matt right now, for sure. Um, the women's side has been kind of um, more of a free for all. So I would, I would classify Annie as kind of the jack of all trades yep. and the overall fit. But certainly, Kristen Clever was more of the gymnast. Um, Sam Briggs is more of the endurance athlete. And then Katrin. I think has been the embodiment of total well-roundedness. Um, she's dominated for the last two years. I shouldn't say dominated, won the last two years. Yep. The other girls that have been on the podium with her and Tia and Sarah, I think are also in that same same mold. Yep. That is the mold of the winner. You can get to the top 10 of the games by being uh, uh, having a major bias, whether it's a more of an endurance play or more of a strength play. But in my opinion, you can't win the games by being there. And that's where Brooke's goal is, is to be on the podium and win, not to be at the games in the top 10. Yep. So for that reason, we have swung her programming quite drastically towards the fitness and conditioning side of things. Gotcha. Cool. Okay, let's get to our chat with Brooke Wells. Brooke, thank you for spending some time with us. Yeah, thanks for having me. <laughs> um, you're in town to train with Ben for a few days, yeah? Yeah. Cool. So um, first thing I wanted to talk to you about is just to get a little bit of a sense of your background. Mm -hmm. um, wh where did you grow up? What was your childhood like in terms of where your energies were paid? Um, and then we'll kind of get into where, when um, CrossFit got into your life, because I know it was pretty relatively young compared to many yeah. people. Um, so I grew up in Arkansas and then I lived in Tulsa, Oklahoma for a lot of growing up. Um, I was a gymnast from a young age until about ninth grade of high school. And that's when I switched to track. So I ran track all four years. Um, and then towards the end of my track career, I kind of realized that I was going from training like four hours from gymnastics to one in track. And so I just like wasn't getting enough um, exercising in. So that's when I started CrossFit. So I started CrossFit like my, um, I think it was my senior the summer of my senior year, okay. before senior year. So when you say that you weren't getting enough 
exercise in? Was it like a like what was the what was not enough? Did, we, did you just have too much energy and like you just needed to go run around for three more hours, or was yeah, it I mean, was it something else? Um, I think it was. I was just like missing working out, and um, yeah, I mean it was just it wasn't anything like gaining weight or anything like that. It was just kind of like I felt like I was missing something. So, um, you have a twin sister, yeah. Who I know also runs track. She currently still runs track. Yes. So t- talk to me about what it was like growing up with a sister who was equally competitive or equally athletic oh my was gosh. that uh i imagine that there were times where that was really good and that there were times where that was oh, not so definitely good. yeah we are very competitive with each other i think overall it was very beneficial because we like we would push each other so hard like you know how like um instead of like wanting to do less work like i swear we would like want to do more work to outwork the other one. So, um, I mean, it was very beneficial. We competed together in gymnastics and track, and then we competed for a while and crossed it together. And that's when she decided she wanted to run track in college. So it's kind of been nice to part ways and have our own thing for a while. But once track is over, I'm sure she'll come back and it'll be the same thing. (laughs) So, I mean, I miss it a lot. It's super fun. It's like a friendly competition, so... Did you run the same events or did you do the same events in track or were you at least a little bit separated there? Um, No. So we actually both started out in the 400 together and she would beat me every time. So I was like, you know what? I'm just going to go run some hurdles. <laughs> <laughs> so I did the 300 hurdles, which okay. is really similar to the 400. Yep. But I think that was mainly influenced by her beating me on the 400. So needing to find something we don't that like you could... to lose to each other. <laughs> Well, track's good in that there are plenty of events that you can sort of, yeah. you can transition into if you need to. Yeah. So we still have the four by four together, which is yep. super fun. Yep. Um, what about, what about your parents? Did they, did they um, encourage that kind of competitive spirit? Did they try to uh, maybe separate you in some way so that you guys had a chance to develop those skills sort of outside of just within the dynamic of each other? Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah, they're... My dad is like probably the biggest influencer of like all my athletics. Um, he's super into that kind of stuff. He, I probably he never missed a track meet. Just like always there for support, and that really encouraged us to be as athletic as we are. Um, yeah, I think they liked us to do the same thing, especially in gymnastics and stuff. But then once Cindy decided to do track and me cross it, I think that they really liked that we decided to do our own thing. Mm-hmm. So it was both. I know you. You said from gymnastics to track was, you, you needed something else, mm-hmm. but you could have done anything. Yeah. So what about CrossFit was the the thing that got you excited? Um. Well, I think with track, I mean, we just literally ran every day. We were never in the weight room. Um, a lot of people like, like some sports will have lifting as just part of their um, training and we didn't have that. So I really liked the lifting side of it. I, um, my family is just pretty naturally strong. And so, um, I was, I loved lifting. That was my favorite part of CrossFit when I first started. I'm still is now, but (laughs) (laughs) Um, I think I was just kind of getting bored of like just running. And so like the variety of CrossFit is what really attracted me to it. Um, What was your first taste of competition or of the competitive element to CrossFit? Because obviously there's a, there's a lot of differences between Mm -hmm. I went to, I went to a CrossFit gym and it was great. And I want to spend two or three hours in the gym yeah. doing this thing. So like, where did, was it, was it immediate that you saw CrossFit and you saw, Ooh, that's a sport no. or was it always, was there like a, was there a gap you had to bridge there? Um, yeah, at first it was just like, I was waking up super early making the five o'clock CrossFit class so that I could get that in before um, I went to school and then track in the afternoon. So I was pretty much training like twice a day. Um, but that was just for fun. It didn't have anything to do with like competing. And then, so I did my first open, um, the first one, I think it was 2013, um, snatches and burpees. And, oh my gosh, I've never (laughs) been so close to throwing up in my entire life during workout. Um, but then my first competition, I did scaled and I actually won my first scale competition. And, um, that was kind of like when I knew I wanted to compete. And so I did one scaled competition and then went straight to RX competitions and 
I just loved it. I was having so much fun out there and I knew that's when I wanted to like take it seriously. Mm -hmm. And so, um, <clears throat> I mean, I had the opportunity to run track um, at University of Central Arkansas, but I, that's when I decided I wanted to focus on CrossFit. So it took about a year and a half um, of just having fun with it when, until I decided to compete. Was that a tough decision to go from, when you said you had an opportunity to run track, was mm -hmm. that like a scholarship opportunity? Yeah. That was, mm -hmm. So was that a tough decision from, in some ways, the sort of safe decision, which is I know what it's going to look like if I run track and I go mm -hmm. to, to school for it versus at that point, CrossFit is just like, yeah. I just, I think I would like it. I think I'd be good at mm -hmm. it, but no guarantees whatsoever that it would amount to anything. Was mm -hmm. that, was that a tough decision? Um, for me, not really, just because like, I mean, I wasn't like great at track. Like I wasn't going to be like the best in the college or whatever. It was just going to be like there to run on scholarship. And so it wasn't something that I really loved and I loved CrossFit. And so I knew I wouldn't like it. And that's kind of why I decided to just pursue CrossFit. Yeah. That it was in some ways it was safer because you, you knew that there was a longer road to it. Yeah. Yeah. That you mm -hmm. would, um, cool. Cool. So you, so you started to do some, some scaled competitions and you, then you started to do some RX competitions. Do you remember when, whether it was a workout or whether, whatever it was, do you remember when you first got the sense that you could be really good at this? Um, I think it was just, um, like I just did really well at the RX competitions without, like much training and I was at that point I was only taking classes and so I'm like well if I started like doing just a little bit extra after classes like working on my weaknesses like then I'll be even better and then I would do started just like adding little things and then just it led to like I got one of the gyms that I went to they had um like regular programming and then they had like um above and beyond so then I switched to that and so I did that for a while and I don't know just I just kept adding little bits. I didn't just go from like a class to, oh, let me get individualized programming and spend four hours at the gym every day. I slowly eased into just adding a little bit here and there and that just led me to where it is now. Did you have any um, any guidance in that sort of that transition? Like, did you have somebody who was helping you make the right decisions or was it like, let's no, see I if mean, this works? <laughs> yeah, at that point I had no guidance at all. I kind of just did it for fun. like. I would just check, like, I was even checking bins at that time. Um, I'd see what Comp Train was doing. I'd see what Invictus was doing. Just, like, little things like that, just looking up fun stuff to do. Yeah. So. But no real. There was no structure no, at exactly, all. Exactly, yeah, yeah, no structure. I was just, I thought that it was benefiting me. I mean, mm -hmm. it did make me better, but it wasn't anything like what I'm doing now. Mm -hmm. So. And this was when you were, you had started college already? This was, like, um, in yeah. that period? Mm -hmm. So, um, I think that that's one interesting element sort of of your experience thus far that I think happened more often in in the early years of CrossFit and that and that's just simply you're you're a games athlete or high level athlete and also you're a teacher or you're a student or you're mm -hmm. something else I think it's it's quickly slowly I don't know it's transition to you're a CrossFit athlete and then that's that's what you do, mm -hmm. right? So you're obviously not that. You're yeah, still in school, it. yeah, um, and obviously still doing this full time. So I'd love to talk about the the challenges that sort of lie in there, and then if you see that as any disadvantage that you currently have that somebody who is just doing this full time mm -hmm. doesn't have. Yeah, I mean, it definitely like. It, it's so weird how going to class for two hours and just sitting there is so draining. Like, um, you're literally just sitting there, but I think it just like makes me tired. And then like, I don't want to go train sometimes. Um, I put my classes in the, I base my schedule around my training schedule. So I would put my classes from like 12 to three. And so I would train in the morning, go to class and then go to the gym afterwards. But I never wanted to go to the gym after class. So this year, what I did was um, put my classes in the morning, and I actually like that a lot better. I wake up, get coffee, just kind of like I'm waking up during my classes, and then I go train. But take that part out, and I feel like I would it would just be way more beneficial. Yeah. So um, I definitely think it is a disadvantage, but 
it does keep me like very busy and just structured every day. So that part's kind of nice because when I do have off days, sometimes I'll like sleep in too long or something like that. Yeah. Or have you been tempted at all, especially after the success that you had last year at the games? Have you been tempted at all to say, you know, I wonder what I wonder what would happen if I took a year off of school? Oh, or for I wonder... sure. Yeah. I mean, I've a lot of people have actually encouraged me to do that, but I mean. I've, I'm so close to being done that like I, I know that if I take a year off that either I won't finish or I don't want to go back or yeah. something like that. Yeah. Um, so do you, tra- do you train alone um, most pretty days? Pretty much, yes. Yeah, because I imagine that not a lot of people have that kind of schedule mm-hmm. or that kind of flexibility. What is that like? Do you, do you like training alone? Is that just something that you've realized, well, it's just the way it has to be and I don't like it or not, or not like it? Um, both. So like, I like the side of it that like, there's no one there to like, you can't look around, see where anyone else is. Because I know that like, sometimes you'll be like, oh, well, I'm way ahead of them. So I can slow down a little bit or something like that. So it's really nice to be able to be like disciplined and just go from time. Mm -hmm. But then also like, I mean, it definitely gets boring and like I sometimes I don't want to be there all day by myself. So, um, I mean, it's even nice that there's just people there. We have an open gym at my gym. And so um, sometimes there will be people there doing their own thing. That's just kind of nice to have company there. Yeah. But yeah, I pretty much do all the workouts alone. <laughs> do you feel like um, that that idea of needing to, to sort of race yourself instead of somebody else, right? Yeah. Is I that think- something that you've you've just been able to do or did you realize that at some point if i'm gonna get better at this i'm gonna have to uh, that's that's a skill i have to learn Mm -hmm. yeah um i think it's definitely a skill that i had to learn um but it does help just like racing against the clock because during competition you don't need to be worrying about what your competitors are doing so learning to just um like find your own pace and do your own thing is really good um it hasn't affected me to where i go to competition and then like oh, well, I've been training alone, so now I'm with people and they're, like, influencing what how I approach the workout. That doesn't happen to me. So, I mean, it does turn out pretty beneficial. Mm-hmm. I'm not worrying about how, like, from day to day, I'm not worrying about how people are breaking up their workout. I'm yep. figuring out how I need to do it. Yep. So. Um, looking at the the sort of the, um, the, the, the winners on the female side, the winners of the CrossFit Games, there's been it's there's been a really interesting mix of types of athlete who have found a lot of success, right? Everybody from Chris, Chris uh, Clever, very very different kind of athlete mm-hmm. than even Sam Briggs or Camille yeah. or Annie, mm-hmm. right? So there's this huge gap, less I think than than the men. The men are like you look like Rich or you look like Matt, yeah. and then there's like a little bit of very, but the women are still sort of wide open. Yeah. You're you're sort of on the other end of somebody mm-hmm. like Chris or even Camille. Camille's a really interesting mix. Um, but you're, you tend to, like you said, you tend to favor the strength. You tend to favor the the barbell stuff. Do you feel like there's still room for a, a quote unquote strong athlete to win the games? <clears throat> or do you think that you need to bring yourself a little bit closer to the middle, whatever that means, gymnastic mm-hmm. stuff, in order to be really, really competitive uh, at the at the top level? Um, me and Ben were actually talking about this yesterday. Um, so yeah, he's like, I still want you to be one of the strongest athletes, but instead of being one of the strongest athletes by like 10%, I want you to be the strongest athlete by 1%. So, um, I think that just like, I mean, we have been nailing all of the gymnastics and, um, aerobic movements. So, and I mean, it hasn't really affected my strength very much at all. So as long as I can get those up without losing much strength, then I think that, one of the stronger athletes could win, but they still have to be well-rounded. So, sure. yeah. I mean, you look at Camille and one of her, she's very good at weightlifting. Yeah. So. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Camille, Camille, when she won, especially she was sort of like unbeatable with yeah. barbell and gymnastics mm-hmm. stuff. So it'll be interesting to see if it ever sort of evens out where it becomes like the guys where they're sort of like, you know what it's going to look like. And then mm-hmm. it's just a matter of sort of variance. Yeah. I don't think like the strong girl can win, but I think like, strong with the other stuff can mm-hmm. win, you know. But you had gymnastics growing up too. So it's mm-hmm. not as if that's not in your yeah. in your in your background. So it's interesting that I think that some people get pigeonholed into different kinds of 
like you're this athlete mm-hmm. or that athlete. Yeah. I think you've been pigeonholed into the strong one. Yeah. And then they for, assume. Other and then you things. assume that it yeah. means that you don't have the other things when mm-hmm. that's obviously not always the case. Yeah. Yeah. So last year you had a really good year at the games. Mm-hmm. How much of that surprised you and how much of that was just surprised everybody else. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? Did you did you do what you knew you could do or did you kind of did ev- was everybody including you surprised a little bit? Um, I mean, I don't go into it like I want to get 6th place. I just want to do the best that I can do and throughout the whole thing I was doing the best that I could do and so I mean, I mean it was surprising that I was 6th place. I didn't really expect that. I had set a goal the at the beginning of the year to be top 10. So, um a lot of my friends and family knew what I was aiming for. So, I mean, they, I'd say more excited than surprised. Mm-hmm. So, um, what did you learn at the games last year that maybe you didn't know or have coming into it? Um, I mean, I pretty much had the same weaknesses last year as I did the year before. Um, so pretty much that told me that, look, like you're not getting any better at these things. So you have to work on them more. Mm-hmm. So, um, Ben's been really good about programming focus work into every day and um, really nailing the weaknesses. So that's one big thing that has changed. Um, what makes you, what makes you so competitive in terms of internally? Like, what makes, what what? Why do you have the drive that you do? Do you have any idea? Hmm. I don't really know. I mean, I'm just. I've always been so competitive. I really think that my twin sister probably has a big thing to do with it. Um, we were literally competing in everything we did growing up. So, I mean, I think that's it. And I just, I mean, I really want to be the best that I can be. So, I mean, it's not even really I'm competitive. I mean, I am competitive with other athletes, obviously. But I think it more comes down to me being competitive with myself. Um, previously, it was probably I just want to be better than Sydney. Yeah. But now it's come down to like, especially training every day, you kind of realize that like you don't even know what people are doing. Yeah. You just need to better yourself. Mm-hmm. So, how much of how much of that have you and how much of that have you and Ben focused on? Because I know, well, first of all, you're you're still new working with Ben. This is this is your first season with mm-hmm. Ben, right? So, um. I'm sure you've gotten a lot of the speeches, right? Yeah. But how much of what you guys have worked on is, would you consider like a mindset focus? Yeah. Or how much of it has been like the nuts and bolts of like, let's do more muscle ups and handstand push ups? Oh, firstly, it's the mental. Um, that's I think that's the biggest thing. Um, no one's really worked with the mental side of it before. So that has been a huge change. I'd say that was definitely number one. He kind of works from um, the mental approach out. So of course, like, we need to get better at my weaknesses and everything, but more importantly, we need to learn how to um, like respond to all the events that happen. So, mm-hmm. so I, I like that inside out or that mindset out. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. Um, how much better do you think it's getting you? Oh, it's completely changed the way that I look at workouts. So, um, I mean, it's a huge factor. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you've got, um, we're recording this just a few days before you head down to Wadapalooza, which mm-hmm. you won last year. Mm-hmm. So is this, this will be your first competition really since starting with Ben and certainly since the games, yeah, right? Yeah, I haven't competed since the games. So is this a test for you? Like, it, or is this, uh, you know, is this a test of, okay, where am I from the games last year? Or is, do you look at this as, okay, this is the beginning of the season and let's, you know, let's, let's see where we're at. Um, I mean, I guess you could go both ways. Um, The number one priority of this weekend is kind of learning um, what works and what doesn't with Ben. Um, Seeing how, just like what, how the way he works, the way I work during competition, because we haven't seen that side. Um, And then making sure my nutrition is in check. um, Just kind of seeing like what I need to work on for regionals. of course, I want to win Wadapalooza. Who doesn't? But that's not like the number one focus this weekend. It's kind of to figure out um, for the future. Mm-hmm. Um, what does what do you think the future looks like for you? You're still a really young athlete. Mm-hmm. You're 21. Yes, 21. So conceivably, you could be doing this for seven or eight or ten more years yeah. <laughs> if you're healthy. Knock on wood. Yeah. Is that is that what you're looking forward to? Yeah. I mean, the plan is to just keep doing this as long as I love it and my body can handle it. Um, so I, I just want to do it as long as I can. Yeah. 
Yeah. Do you worry at all about, um, or not, not worry, but do you, do you think about a train, like a year with that in mind, with the idea, like, I want to be doing this for six or seven or eight years, so I can't go 110% every no. day, or you, you're still at, <laughs> I like, I really don't think about day. that. I literally, I don't even probably take it year by year. I take it, like, day by day, yeah. <laughs> which, I mean, I think that's a good thing. I, I don't need to be thinking about um, how my body's going to be in 10 years, yeah. so... Do you, do you think of yourself as a role model? Do you think of yourself sort of in that, with that sort of idea of you grew, I mean, you're still super young, but you didn't grow up with really a barbell unless you really like sought mm -hmm. it out. Yeah. But now there are girls who it's, it's less weird for them to go mm -hmm. seek out a barbell. Do you think of yourself as a role model to them or is that sort of like a, is that far from your mind? Are you not, uh, are you I mean, not I want to be a role model to girls. Um, Especially like younger girls and um, girls that want are like in college, you know, like college is like very time consuming. And so I get questions all the time about how I deal with both. And so um, I hope to be a role model to people that like want to balance that and to younger girls and I mean, just girls over. I would like to be. Yeah. Yeah. All right. We'll leave it at that. Thank you, bro. Okay. Thanks.